What's up everyone, and welcome to my new obsession. This is Beam NG Drive, and it's a game that has snapped me out of my addiction to Forza Horizon 4. Now maybe you're one of the handful of people who watched some of my Forza videos I made last year, but I was still playing it pretty regularly until recently. Then I tried Beam. For those who don't know, Beam is a game that's been in early access forever. It's essentially a soft body physics engine that you drive around in, and the reason it's replaced Forza for me is simple. The thing I love most about Forza is the ability to customize and tune all of the cars, swapping out engines and drivetrains and suspensions, and doing stupid things like giving tiny cars a thousand horsepower. But it has its limitations. For example, I couldn't, say, take an engine in an American-style sedan and move it to the trunk, like in this rear-engine Porsche lookalike that I'm driving. And maybe that's something I want to do! Well, now I can, with Beam and another game called Automation. So why don't we start by putting the engine from this Porsche into the trunk of an American sedan and see what happens. There was one American sedan with a rear-mounted engine. In the 1960s, Chevrolet launched the Corvair, and it quickly became a popular model. Unlike front-engine sedans, the rear-engine, rear-wheel-drive Corvair sat lower, offered more room for passengers, and handled better without the need for power steering. In a sense, it combined the practicality of a big American sedan with the nimble fun of a European or Japanese sports car, and that made it a huge sell. So what happened? Well, to put it simply, safety happened. The first generation Corvair used swing axle suspension, which was a revolutionary rear wheel suspension design in 1903. I won't bore you with the details, but basically a big drawback of swing axle suspension occurs when the rear of the car lifts up, say under braking, dramatically reducing the grip of the rear wheels. A loss of rear grip means oversteer, and oversteer soon became synonymous with the Corvair brand. The second generation Corvair was introduced in 1965, featuring independent rear suspension, but it was too late. Consumer advocate and future third-party presidential candidate Ralph Nader made the Corvair the focus of his 1965 book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and GM was dealing with hundreds of lawsuits regarding Corvair crashes. By the time new emissions and safety standards were introduced in the late 60s, the Corvair was no more but it retained a core group of fans who insisted that it was a brilliant piece of engineering, unfairly maligned and scapegoated because it dared to be different. Perhaps we can do a bit to honor its memory here by creating a car worth driving. Only one way to find out. So here we are back in beam with our Corvair. Now I think this is sort of what uh, the Chevy Corvair would have looked like if they had kept building it into the 80s. Although I, I decided since this was inspired by a Porsche, we'd give it the Porsche back wing. And as you can see, it's got the, uh, the flat six under there in the rear with the dual exhaust. It's all ready to go. Let's see how it drives. That uh, Porsche turbo lag. Gotta love it. Now we used 1984 for this model year, so it's slightly, slightly newer than the Porsche we were driving. But uh, like I said, it's got the same engine. Let's, let's open it up a bit. Let's see how it, let's see how it handles these twisty mountain roads. So automation gives you uh, a price estimate for how much this car would cost on the market if you were to sell it in, in you know, dollars. I guess we'll just call them automation dollars. And uh, this car comes in at 42000 which is slightly more than the 39000 of the Porsche that I made. And so the Corvair costs slightly more, but you get more interior space. And it's a slightly newer model with slightly newer safety features. So, you know, 
if you're, you know, if you've got a family, instead of just uh, having a midlife crisis, which, you know, if you've got a midlife crisis, you buy the Porsche. If you've got a family, you buy the Corvair. Getting a little too feisty. This is a very narrow road here on the edge of this mountain. But yeah, no complaints. I don't know. I don't know what Ralph Nader was was talking about. This is uh, this doesn't feel unsafe. This feels safe at most speeds. I uh, I gotta say, I'm a fan. Getting a little too aggressive again. <laughs> it's just this car makes you want to, you know, go aggressive into the corners because it just feels like it's so responsive. But then you forget about the fact that most of the weight is at the rear. If the car was full, maybe, you know, it's a little more planted. But uh, as is, I'm not sure what the weight distribution is. Uh, I'll have to put it up on the screen right now. I'll check later on. But uh, it's very, very biased towards the rear. And it makes it nice and nimble, but then it also makes it easy to lose. You can really lose that rear end. All right, well, there we have it. The Corvair. I, I got to say, uh, it's, it's a real shame that uh, America didn't make more rear engine cars because uh, if this is any indication, they, uh, they turn out pretty well. Maybe it's because I used proper suspension on this instead of like, you know, a wooden board with a nail, which is, I think, what they used for the rear suspension in the Corvair in the 60s. But uh, it's a good car to drive. Uh, it's not the, the best in the looks department, but then again, you know, retro's always in at some point. Is 80s retro in right now? Who knows? Find out next time. I'm sure I'm going to be making more videos like this.